In my following Sai Baba, I learned the value of being in school. We are all in school, except this is a school of reaching oneness with God. And in this school, there's no summer vacation, there's no recess, there's no lunch period, there's no graduation, there's no diploma. It's school, school, school. And the day you take your last breath and die, you're in school. And after your last breath, and after you've died, your classwork continues. So Swami took me into the inner interview room, and I've heard all these stories about how stern he can be, how he treated me like a puppy dog. <laughs> he, he hit me four times on my shoulder, and then I said, Baba, I hope I, hope I have a, a healthy long life so I can serve you. And he hit me three times on my chest like this, good heart, good heart, don't worry, don't worry about your health. Well, yes, I asked him, I said, Swami, please, can I take your name to America? I'm a journalist. Can I, may I take your name to America? And he says, no, no, don't take my name to America. Take my love to America. Wow. I was interviewing people here, and I met a young man whose name I won't mention, and I interviewed him. And the sun was going down, it was after Darshan, and I wanted to get to the point I knew he was going to tell me, but I didn't know he was going to tell me it so powerfully. He said, Ted, this is such a powerful machine, and it helps you so much get to know Baba, read his discourses, hear his words, be in study circles. And I did all of that, and it got me nowhere. I didn't know how to reach Baba. And 17 years after I used my head, I finally realized I was at the wrong part. And he went like this, Ted, here's my lesson. Don't think, feel. Don't think, feel. And one last time he said, don't think, feel. And it hit me. I was doing it all wrong. I was using my head. Saram and welcome Mr. Ted Henry to Trist with Divinity, our series on Radio Sai. You are in the studios of Radio Sai in Prashantinilam. When I saw you in Kulwant Hall the other day, I was reminded of your talk in the Divine Presence in 2008. You spoke on the occasion of Christmas and, and I remember the way you started your talk. It was very powerful. You said, we are among the luckiest people on the face of the earth on this Christmas day. We get to be on Christmas day with Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. And it came out with so much of intensity and, and force and power. The crowd just burst out into an applause. I just heard that again yesterday. And I want to ask you, when and how did this conviction, such deep conviction, happen in your life? Well, I'm 67 now, so it took me about 64 years to get to that conviction. First of all, Bishu, I want to say thank you for inviting me to be here. Uh, it's highly unusual, almost unheard of for me to be sitting on this side of the camera. Uh, in my profession as a television journalist, I've conducted maybe 10,000 interviews. Anybody who works for 44 years will conduct 10,000 interviews. But coming to Baba, that's where my real, real important life started, doing interviews as side devotees. And it's such a thrill and a privilege to hear people's stories and to be asked to give my story puts the shoe on the other foot so it's a little different for me. Those words, that passion, came from the worst week of my life, the worst Christmas of my life, when I was told that I had to speak from my heart on Christmas Day in the Divine Presence. I froze. If I would have had my car here, I would have driven home to America oh my God. to avoid that. My wife and I had, she wanted me to speak from the depths of my heart, and I didn't know how to do that. I didn't know how to get there. I've never been asked to do that before. Why were you so hesitant? It's not that I was hesitant. It's just that most people live in some form of self-control, self-editing, or even fear. And what you're fearful of is to reveal your true self outwardly. Maybe fearful of being ridiculed. Maybe fearful of making a fool of yourself. Maybe fearful of making a mistake. And so finally, at the middle of the night, before Christmas, it came to me that this is among 
the most important moments in the history, not just of the world, but of the universe, of the whole cosmos, to be there literally in the figurative, literal, physical presence of Jesus Christ himself, of, of Baba, of Moses, of Abraham, of Isaiah, of all, of, of Rama, of Krishna, of all the spiritual presence in the history of human record and beyond. This was the pinnacle, this is the ultimate. And that registered on me, and that's why I said it the way I did, because I felt that strongly about it on Christmas Day in Baba's presence. Fantastic. So you said it was a long process of getting there. Yes. And articulating that was another challenge. May I ask you how and when did this process start? This process started when I was given the false impression that I was doing seva for people around the world who love Sai Baba. The false impression I had was that I was going out and interviewing people for what soldiers, that's the name of the, the banner of the service that we try to provide for people, heart-to-heart -heart interviews, just like you've done for years with Radio Sai. I'm a competitor of yours. <laughs> But I'm so small, it doesn't make any difference. But the stories are important. They're equally as important as your stories. How a person's life is transformed, and to have a person explain that is of great value to other people who might be watching or listening on Radio Sci. So I thought, what a great service we're doing for Baba, and I'm going to talk about sojourns. That's going to be the point of my message on Christmas Day, and to thank Baba for giving me this vehicle, to allowing me to be the vehicle to help people's stories be converted. After three days of soul searching at a very deep level, uh, what I said in my talk later on Christmas Day was, first Baba hooks you, yes, and then he cooks you. He had been, he hooked me 15 years ago, and he's been cooking me for more than 14 years. I said, it wasn't that I was doing seva for Baba by recording these 175 hour long video interviews with devotees. It was that he was giving me the gift of slow, steady awareness to who my higher self is. And those interviews were not primarily recorded for the benefit of anybody who saw them. Those interviews were primarily recorded for my benefit. They're what brought me to Baba. Baba has told me over the course of 15 years, good man, good husband, good person, Doubting Thomas. Mm -hmm. And I would think, oh, ooh, that hurts. Baba, I'm not a Doubting Thomas. Well, we all have doubt in us. And just the other day, I learned a valuable lesson from a young man who's a mystic, I would say, who loves Baba. And he says, Ted, it's okay to doubt, but get to the point where you begin to doubt the doubt. Mm -hmm. Doubt the doubt, and the doubt will soon go away. Well, in my walk with Baba, it's gone away, and it totally went away on that Christmas day when I realized, after being asked to speak before him, what my true message was. Not that I was thanking Baba for the seva, but that I was thanking Baba that he gave me these people to share these stories with me for my benefit. And if anybody else could benefit, that's fine. But he was working on me. And you call this the boomerang leela. This is the boomerang leela. I thought I was casting the boomerang out to, to, um, to serve you for your doubts and for your spiritual edification and you and you. It's only for me. It all came back to me. You caught that word. Yes. Yeah. So it gives me chills right now to think about it because I didn't think I had a message worth mentioning in front of Baba. Uh, and in the same talk you mentioned addressing Baba, you said, Baba, you are the Christ consciousness. And then you added, you are my Christ consciousness. Yeah, there is only one. Uh, you and I could have a healthy debate for four hours regarding Baba's primary lessons for us all. And if I ask you spontaneously to give me four of them, you would give me four right off the top of your head. For me, there's only one. I'd give you the same answer over and over and over again. It's Advaita, it's oneness. It's that you too are the divine. And that this impenetrable, seemingly impenetrable Maya must be penetrated. We must pierce it. It has to be. And if we don't do it this lifetime, maybe we'll do it the next 3,000 lifetimes. But one day it will be penetrated and we will see the myth of who we believe ourselves to be. And his lesson is so clear about that 
over and over again. And people will say, Ted, I disagree with you violently. I strongly disagree with you. You know, Seva, Namasmarna, Budgeons, Helping the Poor, all of these other projects of huge merit are equally as important. Well, in my view, they're hugely important. But they all go away when you realize that we're all living the dream of who we think we are. And when Baba says, and I can't remember his precise words, let's say when somebody's in an awful car accident and their two children are killed, or when war breaks out here, or another tsunami takes the west coast of America, or when somebody does something awful against their spouse or their child, and in a moment of repentance they say, Baba, please forgive me, please forgive me. I have sinned, I have done wrong, I have harmed people. His response is, don't worry, for I have willed it. Everything is his will, no matter how beautiful, no matter how awful it is, to help us to awaken to two items. How big our ego controls us, number one, and number two, which is actually number one, to awaken from the maya to atma. I'm reminded of the example that Swami gives of a dog which goes into this house of mirrors. And as the dog animates and barks and all these reflections of the dog also bark and he gets agitated. What is happening? This I'm not doing this. Who are these people barking at me? And then he gets more and more agitated. Then he breaks the mirror and he, now he finds there are more dogs. There's a million dogs million now. million dogs now. <laughs> so until uh, he realizes that he has to be calm, then mm. everything else also calms down. That dog is me. <laughs> I had a, a spiritual teacher of mine tell me the other day, uh, a good person. I said, you know, my wife is so sattvic. She's so beautiful. She's so wonderful. And I'm so rajasic. Uh, and this person told me, don't ever worry about your rajasic nature. It causes you to do your work. It, 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 it's the driving force behind doing your work. Remember to keep life in balance to the best of your ability, but use the rajasic part of your life to do the work for Baba. Yeah, I think everybody is a combination of uh, yeah. all the three, Rajasik, Sattvic and uh, uh, Sattvic and Tamsik. Yeah. And we are different in permutation and combination of all these three and at different points in time, we are one yes. guna is predominant, uh, yeah. is predominant in our uh, right. faculties. So I want to get back to where uh, we started from. I want you to share about your journey, how and when it began. Well, I'm 67 years old, and I was raised Catholic. I won't go through my whole life, but I was a very good little Catholic boy. I always loved Jesus. I always loved drawing closer to God. And then like many people, we call it high school. I'm not sure what you call it here, and then college. Young people in America tend to fall away from their religion. It's a good thing. It's a good thing to fall away from your religion so that you come back on your own terms one day to what your true spiritual values. You do the search within. You do the search within, yeah. Uh, it would be not as effective if people forced you to go to church every Sunday all through those years. Better for you to fall away and come back on your own. And in 1968, maybe a couple of years before you were born, <laughs> a couple of decades before you were born, <laughs> yes. I joined what was called the Peace Corps. It's an American SAVA organization that sends young men, 20, 22, around the world. And I lived in Paraguay in South America for two years on my own. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the purpose is to do good, to help people down there, struggling people. In that period, 1968 to 1970, I was looking through an old magazine, so old the cover was torn off. I didn't know the date. Mm -hmm. I was hungry to read anything, and so it didn't matter. I'm turning page 50, 51, 52. There's a picture of Sai Baba. It's about this big, and a little inscription under it, and some devotees from America dressed in their whites, and I was very critical. Mm -hmm. I said, what fools they are. Mm -hmm. This is a cult. I feel for these young men. I feel for them. They're being duped by this, this swami. Well, that was my ignorance. That was my projection. That was a 100% incorrect assessment on my part. But it was my first peak, first glimpse of Sai Baba, and I've never forgotten it. So he actually allowed me to see his form and to read his name in 1968, 69. And then fast forward, 1992, 
I had a, um, a crisis in my life. Many people do. In 1989, uh, my marriage ended, and I decided I'm going to start the search for my true self because I thought I had it all worked out, <clears throat> and my wife uh, of 16 years left me, and I couldn't figure out why. So it really was, in hindsight, one of the biggest blessings in my life. I went to a minister whom I regarded very highly in my town after six weeks of not telling a soul that I was getting divorced. And I said, Ken, please pray for me. My wife is leaving me. Would you pray to God for my marriage to be saved? And he stumped me. He stunned me. He turned to me and he said, Ted, I don't know that I can do that. I don't know that that's what God wants for you. Mm. He didn't know Baba, but he did know that we're not the doer and that I was going through divorce for a reason. I was going through pain for a reason. My wife too, but I was going through it for my own reasons. And slowly but surely, Baba came into my life in a way that became more meaningful. I saw him in 1968. In 1992, four, three years after my divorce, I went around the world as a journalist, and I only had one meeting lined up. The rest of it was just sort of an ad lib trip. And that one meeting was with Mother Teresa in Calcutta. Mm. And in Calcutta, I spent three and a half days. She allowed me to feed the dying men. And I stayed in the home of uh, devotees of Mother Teresa who made the food for Friday for one day a week. And they hosted me for three and a half days. And as I was leaving, they said, now that you've come halfway around the world to visit one of the spiritual icons of your Catholic tradition, one day we hope and pray you come back to meet our spiritual icon, our mm -hmm. spiritual teacher. His name is Sri Satya Sai Baba. Okay. And I said, oh, I know who that person is. I remember just seeing his name in his picture. And oh, yes, he's very, very dear to us all. And then in 19... 97, when I met Jody, Jody Cleary, who's my wife and partner and does the work of soldiers with me, uh, the very first day I met her, she said, well, I'm sorry I won't be seeing you again. You're a nice man, and I, I'm going to India, and I'm going to go visit my teacher, and you've never heard of him before, so it's been very nice knowing you. And I said, well, try me. Who, who is your teacher? What's his name? How do you know I've never heard of him before? Sri Satya Sai Baba. I know who Sai Baba is. So she came back from India. She had some profound, miraculous occurrences with Baba here, and the rest is history. We got married, and uh, I started coming to Baba and started to have profound experiences here as I do today. I'm not a person who sees auras. I don't have Baba speak audibly in my ear. I don't have too many dreams where he comes to me. Uh, he has allowed me to have several, maybe up to six face-to-face -face encounters and interviews with him, made a beautiful ring for me. Uh, and, and I have him in my heart always. But I found out that I didn't need to have these extraordinary experiences that so many people here seem to have. What I experience, and if anybody's watching this who's never been here, now that this is my first time to be here in Prashanti, post his Maha Samadhi, I would invite others to come too. Because everyone I talk to experiences the same thing I do. You get up in the morning, you go to breakfast or you skip breakfast. You go to darshan or you skip darshan. You stay in the ashram or you go out of the ashram. It doesn't matter. You run into people and experiences and stories that just knock you for a loop. This is very special turf. The grounds here are filled with extraordinary vibrations that even with a man like me, they reach me with the people I come into contact with. So I challenge anybody who's watching this who's never been here before, even though they might not see Sai Baba in the form walking through the hall, to come here with no expectations, but to just be in this stew, just to sit in this stew for two or three days or two or three weeks or two or three months as we are, and let it happen. It'll change, it'll contribute to the change in your life that goes on forever. And let me just make this one last point. In my following Sai Baba, I learned the value of being in school. We are all in school, except this is a school of reaching oneness with God. And in this school, there's no summer vacation, there's no recess, there's no lunch period, there's no graduation, there's no diploma. It's school, school, school. And the day you take your last breath and die, you're in school. And after your last breath, 
and after you've died, your classwork continues. So if you see it that way, then people must, if not come here, must realize that every day they get up, they have to focus on the value of that day's lessons. Maybe they'll be in a car accident. Maybe somebody will give them a thousand dollars. Maybe they'll get fired from their boss. Maybe somebody will come over and do a real nice loving gesture for them. All of it educates us to what's real in our lives. As you mentioned about we being eternally in a school, and when that's what uh, I gathered. You had said when someone asked you in 2009 when you left the Channel 5 uh, yeah. TV station after serving there for almost 40 years doing broadcasting and someone asked you what are your future plans and you said I will be in school the school will never end <laughs> and I you said went that, Dad. yes <laughs> and you went on to add I hold a deep personal conviction that the mysteries of the spirit are the last great journalistic frontier Right, because I'm reporting on this to my last breath, and then I'll come back as a dog, maybe, or I'll come back as <laughs> I'll be, come back as this gentleman or that gentleman, and and I'll have some way to communicate the love I've learned from Baba and pass it on as a journalist again in my next incarnation. Beautiful, as we're talking about sharing this love that you received from Baba, and you mentioned that you had the chance of having one-to-one -one interactions with Swami mm -hmm. for a couple of times. He blessed you with that ring and all that. And I know in 2003, you definitely had an interview with Swami. Mm -hmm. So can you please share with us a few snippets of oh. those beautiful moments that you sp uh, had with Swami inside the interview? The, the newly selected director of the hospital, super specialty hospital, Chaudhry Valetti, yes. uh, came to my town in Ohio and I got to interview him. I loved his stories about Baba. One day when he was here, he usually has his family, and Baba would always call him in for an interview. And his family wasn't with him, so he recognized that I was there, and he said, I can't guarantee anything, Baba's in charge. But when Baba calls me in for an interview tomorrow morning, as he always does the day I leave, I will ask him if you can come. Oh, he says, you'll have seven seconds to run from the back of the hall all the way to the front, because I'll be the last guy he takes in. You have seven seconds. I'll wave, if you don't see me, you're done. So this is what happened. I mm -hmm. got in and I asked uh, Baba. This is in 2003 uh, or before? Or before. Before, okay. It's probably 2001. Okay. Uh, so I got into the interview room and Baba's in the inner interview room and I can't resist. Chaudhry, how did you do this? How did you get Baba to allow me to come in? <laughs> he said, well, it was by uh, the skin of my teeth, which is an American expression. He said, it almost didn't happen. Well, why? What happened? Because I said, Swami, thank you for inviting me in. A friend of mine, Ted, he's here. He's a good person. He would like to come in. He's a good person, Swami. And Swami said, in whose estimation? And then he said, no, no, Baba, Baba. Yeah, he's a good devotee. I know Ted. He's new to you, but he's a very good devotee. And Baba said, in whose point of view? All of these questions... And, and Chaudhry said he thought his goose was cooked, that Ted would never get in. And finally, Swami said, go, go for, for me too. So I got in there, and it was just a wonderful, delightful time. And Swami took me into the inner interview room, and I've heard all these stories about how stern he can be, how he treated me like a puppy dog. <laughs> he, he hit me four times on my shoulder, and then I said, Baba, I hope I, hope I have a, a healthy, long life so I can serve you. And he hit me three times on my chest like this. Good heart, good heart, don't worry. Don't worry about your health. So I asked him, I said, Swami, please, can I take your name to America? I'm a journalist. Can I, may I take your name to America? And he says, no, no, don't take my name to America. Take my love to America. Wow. Uh, and, and That's powerful. It, so it's very, very powerful. And then when he asked me um, some stories about my wedding ring, I showed him my wedding ring, and he says, very nice ring, very good ring. I can do better. But he didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> and then the interview in the inner room ended, and we come out, and he sits me down right in front of him, and he looks at the 18 people there, many of them from the Atlanta Center, he called him. And I felt like I was his trained monkey. I'm sitting there looking at Swami, and he's looking at everybody else, and he looks at me, and he says, what do you want? And I've, you've probably heard these stories a thousand times. And I said, oh, Baba, I want liberation. 
no, 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 no. What, what is it that you want? And I said, oh, Baba, I want to serve you for the rest of my life as long as I can. No, 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 no. What is it that you really want? Material. <laughs> and thinking, what material thing do I really want? Oh, yeah, he talked about my ring. Baba, I would love to have a ring. And he smiled and goes like this, and out pops this, this green ring, and he holds it in his hand for everybody to see, and then I begin to sense that he's going to attempt to put this ring on my finger, and I pushed his arm away. I did the unthinkable. I pushed Baba's arm away because I was fearful it wouldn't fit and I didn't want to embarrass him. <laughs> and he pushed my arm away, <laughs> took the ring and said, big ring for a big boy. Doubts, doubts. <laughs> <laughs> doubts. Big ring for a big boy. And he put it right on there. And because I'm a journalist, this is funny. It was embarrassing, but I don't mind. So at that point, the doubting Thomas became a trusting Ted? became a trusting Ted, just as I said in my, my talk. At that point, all of these young chaps from Atlanta, there were several doctors there with Chaudhry and me. I'm the only one asking questions in an hour. I asked about 18 to 20 questions in a row. Uh, I just asked, I'm a journalist, I'm right, I'm I know all these questions. We, I want answers. <laughs> and, what? I want answers. <laughs> <laughs> rarely, do, oh. rarely do we get journalists asking questions to Baba. You had that unique chance. Two things, and I said, Baba, uh, I asked like the 18th question. And then he turns to me and says, you talk too much. <laughs> and then he turns to everybody else and smiles and doesn't take any questions from them. And he comes back to me and he said, next question? <laughs> so I started asking another five questions. And, and uh, oh, what was the point I was going to make? He finally told me, uh, after I had a chance. This is actually the second interview with my wife. And my wife and I were both very, very happy to receive his blessings. Two things happened. We're with a group of 12 people from Cleveland. We sit down. I sit right in front of him. As he's sitting down, he looks at me and he says, how is wife's left eye? <laughs> well, nobody knew that she had just had an operation on her left eye but me. And he did that for my benefit. He just did it for my, I know, I know, she will be okay. I was there is what he said. He was there. In, in the surgery for my wife's operation on her eye, I was with her, and she had a Baba healing picture there, a locket with Baba around her neck, and the booty on her forehead and here, and she was clutching an image of Baba and doing the Gayatri Mantra. <laughs> so I, I was very impressed at the strength of her faith. And as a testimony to my doubting Baba as we walk in, the very first thing he says to anybody, he walks up to me and says, how is wife's left eye? So the significance to you isn't very profound because you've heard a thousand stories. No, I think every time you hear these, <laughs> these hit you, always. And then in that same interview, Jody, my wife and I, got this from Baba. Baba, I would like to interview you. And Jody said, Baba, Ted's a, a journalist from America. He's many, many years. He does good work. He interviews all sorts of people on a spiritual path. It would be wonderful for the Amer people of America to hear your words, to do an interview with you. And I said, yes, Baba, please, I hope you say yes. He said, yes, yes, my time is now. We took that as yes. So we left the interview. We went directly over, directly over to Chakravarti's office, Mr. Chakravarti. And his office was down where the canteen, across from the canteen, and these four fans are going a thousand miles an hour, and he's got a phone here and a phone there. And he's talking to people and taking notes and giving orders. What a busy man. What, a, what monumental responsibilities he had. He finally gives us 20 seconds. <laughs> Mr. Chakravarti, my name is Ted, this is Jody. We just came from our wonderful, wonderful interview with Sai Baba, in which we asked him if we could interview him, if I could interview him. I'm a journalist from America. And he said, yes, yes, my time is now. We would like your permission to arrange for an interview with Sri Satya Sai Baba. That's interesting. Now, excuse me for making this sound, but this is what he did. He looked at me and he went, that will never happen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> but I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> this is really an interesting anecdote. <laughs> But because okay. Swami said the time is now, it is already <laughs> happening. <laughs> I think that that is the whole, uh, uh, we'll have to dwell on what he really meant when yeah. he said that time is now.
Do I have time for another real quick story? Yeah, sure. 30 second story. In another interview, I asked Swami for the second time what I could do to help him. I was already doing interviews. We started interviews immediately in 1997. We would send them out VHSs. We'd send them out to people around the world for free. And then DVDs send them out to people around the world for free. And then finally we went up on the internet. In the second interview, or third interview with him, this is in Vrindavan, in the summertime. I said, Baba, uh, with your permission, could I work with some of your strongest devotees? And I mentioned Isaac Tigret's name. <laughs> and he said, yes, yes, good, good person. <laughs> good heart. And I said, I would like to work with him. Yes, yes. Well, this is the second time I asked if I could work with Isaac Tigre. A, he's American. B, he had a legendary story with his House of Blues and uh, Hard Rock Cafe. C, I was very intrigued that Baba would accept the contribution he got to build a super specialty hospital coming from the Hard Rock Cafe, which was a center for veg and non-veg. And soft drinks and alcohol drinks. I wanted to know more about the lessons and all that. Baba has lessons in everything that happens with his name to it, with his hand associated with it. Yes, 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 good work, good work, work with him. That's what he said. Uh, he didn't actually say work with him. He said, yes, yes, good work, implying work with him. So we go home, it's winter time, it's December, there's a blizzard in Cleveland, Ohio. I took my 16-year-old daughter from my first marriage down to Key West, Florida, where it's sunny and warm. We're on motorbikes. I'm bonding with my teenage daughter. And the phone rings, my cell phone, and it's Jody at home. Ted, you won't believe who just called me. And I said, okay, I give. Who called you? Isaac Tigret just called me. And I said, we've been trying to find Isaac Tigret for the last two years. We've gone, we've gone to his office in Los Angeles. We've written him. We've faxed him. We've emailed him. We've UPSed him, and he never responds to anything. Well, he called me. He's trying to find you. Here's his number. Call him right now. And I said, well, how did, how did he call us, and why? Here's what he said. He said, Mrs. Henry, Jody, Ms. Cleary, I'm standing here in the middle of the San Francisco International Airport about to get on a plane. I think he was going to London. And I've got my passport in my hand, and I open it, and there's a tiny slip of paper on which it says, call Ted Henry at this number. He had no idea how it got there. He had no idea who I was. He had no idea what I was going to talk to him about. And I said, well, I'm a Sai Baba devotee. I've asked Sai Baba twice to work with you if it's possible, and this must be an answer to a prayer. If you don't know how that slip of paper got in your passport, I don't know how. And we arranged to meet, and we talked for eight hours in New York City at the Trump Plaza Hotel where he was staying once he got back from London. Uh, and we talked about all the work that is to be done by all of us, which we're doing now. And that's just one of many, many, many Sai Baba stories that I can talk about first person. I collect like you do, superb, exemplary stories of love and spiritual transformation, which are secondhand. My stories are, to you, secondhand. So seldom are we able to refer to our own first-hand accounts. And it's what, it's the single factor that drew Jody Cleary, my wife, to Sai Baba. She loves Jesus. She loves spiritual paths. She loves spiritual teachers. But she wanted to have an experience of the divine. And Sai Baba came into her life at the time she was seeking Sai Baba. And she knew because he was alive, walking, Walking the ashram of Prashanti Nilayam, she could have an experience of the divine. And of course she found out, what everybody finds out, you don't have to be here to have an experience of the divine. And you didn't have at any point in your life a mental conflict or inner struggle reconciling Sai Baba and Jesus Christ. Well, again, he called me a doubting Thomas and I'm a reporter that balances both ends against the middle. And for what it's worth, I'm a Libra. The astrological sign of a Libra is the scales. So for forever, I could never be on a jury if my life depended on it. If he was accused of uh, robbing a bank and the evidence was overwhelmingly in favor of convicting him, I couldn't convict him. 
I'd say, but look at his face. Look at that smile. <laughs> that's not the smile. He's got love in his eyes. That's not the that's not the face. That of is a, the flip of a side thief. of liberals. <laughs> but liberals also can be very determined. <laughs> yeah, I'd say he's innocent in my book. I could not. So that's the trouble I had with Sai Baba for many many years because he was such a powerful figure in my life. But it was that Christmas talk that did it, because I in effect came out of the closet in favor of Sai Baba publicly for the world because I was a journalist for many years. I took Sai Baba ring and I put it that way because you hold your hand up in front of the cameras just like I'm doing now. And I didn't want people to ask questions. Where did this green ring come from? Tell me the story behind it. I was too fearful. So my liberation day came on Christmas Day. I was a real strong devotee, don't get me wrong, until 2008. But on Christmas Day, 2008, speaking in the Divine Presence so was my liberation day, liberation day. And you know what happened? You didn't see this on the video. Or you wouldn't hear it on the audio. I spoke, I was supposed to speak for 15 minutes. I spoke for 23 minutes because <clears throat> I got carried away. Five minutes into my talk, my heart's beating like this. I'm very excited. I'm very nervous. I, I glance at Sai Baba. And he's having the boys wheel him away out of the mandir. mandir. Baba, I didn't know if I should stop speaking or sit down or that I was saying the wrong things or what. But, you know, when the... That can be very devastating. You have to keep going. The show goes on. You, you're here for a purpose. You must give your talk. So I kept speaking. And Jody, my wife, said she could feel the air go out of my lungs. She could feel... <laughs> life being drained out of my body. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know what the reason is. I can't think about it now. I've got to keep giving my talk. Five minutes later, I look and here he comes walking. He comes being pushed back into the big smile on his face. I don't know where he went or why. It's okay. He came back and he was very loving, very, very effusive in his love to me after the talk. These are all tests for two purposes to weaken and diminish and decimate our ego and to allow us to pierce the veil of our true selves, of our higher consciousness. Fantastic. I'm just reminded of uh, a quote that Gandhiji made when he was talking about God, when he had traveled to England and, and the gramophone company there asked him to record something. He said he will talk about God and he said, God to be God should not only merely satisfy the intellect. God, to be God, should touch the heart and transform the senses. He was so astute. And, and words of that caliber must be given time to sink in. I was interviewing people here, and I met a young man whose name I won't mention, who lived at Vatican City. He wasn't a priest. He just lived in Vatican City in, in Italy. And he worked in a restaurant washing dishes six months every year for 17 years. And he made enough money to live on and to save. And for the other six months, he lived here at Prashanti Nilayam for 17 years. And I interviewed him. And the sun was going down. It was after Darshan. And I wanted to get to the point I knew he was going to tell me. But I didn't know he was going to tell me it so powerfully. He said, Ted, this is such a powerful machine. And it helps you so much get to know Baba. Read his discourses. Hear his words. Be in study circles. Use this to repeat the name of the Lord as sweet as it is on your tongue. Use this to think about your involvement and save a projects for other. And I did all of that and it got me nowhere. I didn't know how to reach Baba. And 17 years after I used my head, I finally realized I was at the wrong part. And he went like this, Ted, here's my lesson. Don't think, feel. Don't think, feel. And one last time he said, don't think, feel. And it hit me. I was doing it all wrong. I was using my head. Now, I'm not there yet. You know, you and I have a lot in common. We have to use this. It has to be engaged to do our work that Baba wants us to do. But we can get trapped here too much. And if you work hard your whole life, you can't find the lock to open the door to get out of here and unless you have somebody express it to you much like this man did to me because this is where we must be and we can only get there with intentional work 
We have to be aware of it and work towards getting there. And the blessings of a divine master, the guidance of a divine master, the way he, he guides us and the way he chisels us. <laughs> the way he chisels us? Yes. Exactly. Great word. No, he, he chisels us all the time and the chiseling hurts. And my opinion is if you allow the chiseling to go on and allow the hurt to accumulate, one day you'll look back and you'll say, thank you, Baba. Thank you for the chiseling. Without the chiseling, I wouldn't have worked so hard. I want you to share a little more about this chiseling aspect because I think that is the journey of every devotee who comes to Swami. Mm -hmm. You grow on the spiritual path and the greatest blessing of having a divine master like Sai Baba is what you would have probably achieved on the spiritual path in say four or five uh, births or ten births. He just telescopes it. Yeah, yeah. And, and every when we hear the, the experience of every devotee, how they have grown, mm -hmm. that is a source of inspiration and that is the touch of the Divine Master. I want you to share how he has transformed you. Well, again, we're all unique. We're all different from one another, even though we're all one. But in Maya, we're all different. You use the Maya to grow out of the Maya. It, it, on the spiritual path, it's very important to realize how we come to Baba because then once we get to his feet, his divine lotus feet, we can see that we can help one another in their unique journey. Two examples. Jody was searching for an experience with the divine. Good Catholic, but it wasn't enough. Good student of A Course in Miracles, which is a profound book of Advaita, it wasn't enough. When she picked up the book after she heard of Sai Baba, and this I've story I've heard many times by Sam Sanwise, uh, I think she said she got up to page nine and she absolutely knew Sai Baba was God. She didn't need to read another page or another word. Which was his book? Uh, a psychiatrist, the Holy Man. Holy, Holy Man and Psychiatrist. Psychiatrist. Yeah. She absolutely knew. Uh, I know Sam pretty well and you know him pretty well. And uh, we all have our edges and we all have our gifts and we all have our areas in which we're trying to cope in our growth towards closeness with Swami. That was what I call a seminal work. He was used as a divine instrument in an enormous way. I'm still hearing stories about how that book serves people. So even though we are used in huge ways as an instrument of the divine, doesn't mean that we're going to come any faster or any closer to Baba. We have to use our own approach. And for me, I was 180 degrees away from the way Jody arrived at Baba's feet. I was the doubting Thomas. I was, the, I was incapable of making a decision. The only thing I was sure about was I would give my life to roll back time 2,000 years to walk in the footsteps of Jesus and to be a follower. Well, that eventually came to me with Baba, but it took a long, long time. And it's okay. Again, my friend who told me here, Carl from Austria, Ted, I, I reread your talk from Christmas Day. He just told me this a few days ago. He said, my only advice to you, and I said, Carl, you don't have to give me advice. I'm beyond that. He says, but do you, do you still have doubts about anything about yourself? Do you have doubts at all about how divine you are, how, how, how much love is coming to you, how much love you're giving to others? Do you have any doubts about that? And I said, well, we all have doubts. And he says, Ted, doubt the doubt. And that made enormous impact on me, and it's, I've been benefiting from it since I heard it. And it reminds me of something another spiritual figure in my life told me. It's a woman, and she said one day, out of the blue, something I'd never heard before about love. <laughs> it may not make sense to you. Ted, love the love. Love the love. It does make sense. It, it, what can you do to top love? Love the love. There's always a way to top it. There is no ceiling on desires, which is a negative concept. There's no ceiling on love. Love the love. Make it grow for you. Here in Prashanti Nilium, or in South Africa, or in Paraguay, or in Canton, Ohio, my hometown. Love the love. Hold Baba in your heart. If you're gifted with the ability to have visions or to hear his words, love the love. If you are somebody like me for whom none of that happens, love the love. It all takes you slowly, steadily closer to the Baba who you are. I meet people now, as you probably do. Don't call me Bishu. Call me Baba. 
Don't call me Ted. Call me Baba. Well, that's a little much for me. I'm not there yet. It's, it may, I'm not comfortable doing that yet. But I understand the point. There is only love. There is only, there's two courses, there's two messages of the Course in Miracles, which is a world-renowned book for the West that has to do with Advaita. I asked Baba twice to his face, and he told me twice he's the author of A Course in Miracles. There's two emotions it talks about. One is the emotion of love, and one is the emotion of fear. And it says, of those two, only one is real. So you have to get over the fear. Fear is the greatest negative power on earth. A wonderful description of ego is anything that separates you from God. If, it, if you had the world's best dictionary and looked up what fear, what ego is, it would say, in spiritual terms, it's anything that separates you from God. So that's greed, that's fear, that's guilt, that's remorse, that's hunger, that's lust, that's, that even can be something you enjoy doing. I love going out on a boat and sailing in the water. All of that, your love for that, separates you from God. Somebody That's, put it very beautifully. Ego is edging God out. Edging God out, yes. And anything that edges God out. Even seva can be ego. So, and Baba himself said, don't become attached to my form. That's ego. So these are, these are enormous messages I don't expect people watching this to necessarily agree with. I take Baba's words as literally as I can, and yet I try to get the essence. And, what, and since this is Christmas time, I can say this. My powerful attraction to Baba is similar to my powerful attraction to Jesus in one key way. I think they both speak in parables. Baba would have 22,000 people sitting in the crowded mandir on any holiday, and he would be speaking to the people from tribes and from villages with no education, and he'd be speaking to PhD professors and students with lots of education and experience and insights. He would say one phrase and it would be interpreted 500 ways, 20,000 ways. And each person would get the right significance. Jesus did that and they were called parables. Baba speaks, in my view, others would disagree with me perhaps, metaphorically to the individuals. So you hear his clear, distinct message as it's meant for you on your path. It's one, one for all doesn't apply. There's 20,000 interpretations of his messages. So when I come here, it's taken me a long time to learn that. And, and now I feel it's my duty, my job, my work to help explain some of these understandings. I might be wrong, and it's, if I'm wrong, I apologize and I'm sorry for it. But I really believe some of Baba's greatest services to us is to see that there's multiple ways to look at the same facet. In fact, the first lesson of the Course in Miracles that he says he wrote is that nothing is as it appears. Nothing is as it appears. So we have to take to heart the meaning of that phrase, that what you were believed to be truthfulness taught to you by your parents or your uncle or the nuns in the Catholic schools that perhaps you were educated by, which you believe then to be true, it might be a variation of the truth. It might be close to the truth. It might be the truth or it might not be the truth. Nothing is as it appears. So keep exploring. Stay in the school of spiritual pursuit. That's what I'm trying to do. Beautiful. As you are mentioning about different dimensions of Swami's discourse, I remember in the when Swami started speaking in the early years of uh, his avatarhood, he very clearly mentioned that his discourses are not lectures; they are mixtures. They're mixtures. That's great. Now I, I haven't heard that. That's they're mixtures. They are mixtures. They're not lectures because they mixtures. are, as you said, yeah. to be taken differently by different people, and and as you said, because there is a plethora of different kind of people yeah. in the audience, and he yeah. caters to everyone. And how many thousands of stories are there where people sit in the uh, mandir and they wait hours for Baba to come, and they have a hugely important pressing issue, maybe life or death, uh, maybe just a, a important know about their marriage or whatever, and Baba will give a discourse and speak directly to the issue in that individual's mind. How many stories we have heard? How many stories? <laughs> Plenty. Yeah. Now I want to ask you, uh, 
something on these lines you have by Swami's grace moved in the journey from a doubting Thomas to become now a trusting Ted and now <laughs> moving on to uh, almost attain that state where you feel the oneness of yeah. divinity we have been fortunate to actually see Baba physically mm -hmm. but now the number of people that have physically seen Swami is actually if you look at the population of the world it is a microscopic minority yes and now every day you see so many new people are coming into the Sai 4 they're learning about Swami they're hearing about Swami mysterious things are happening all mm -hmm. over the world there are new Christians also coming into the fold mm -hmm. and just like you went through this journey of doubt I suppose there'll be a lot of Christians also will have very difficult time trying to reconcile many things as they learn about Swami, as they begin to read about Swami. What would you like to say to them? This is the most important topic you've raised. This is the most important topic for all of us in this room and for you who might hear this on Radio Sai or see it. This is, your duty is changing because Baba's physical form is no longer here. The heavy work of growing closer and closer to doing our duty for Baba has quadrupled in scope and size in this key area. You know, Christians, Catholics proselytize. They, they, they go out to share Jesus with the world, to spread Jesus to the world. Baba has a different view on this. He doesn't say, give my name to people. He doesn't say, go out and bring people into my fold. He doesn't say he wants a religion named after him. That doesn't mean you get off free. More than ever, now that his physical form, you have to live who you are as Baba. You have to live it in such a way that people will come up to you and say, I'm so depressed. I don't, the boss doesn't like me. I didn't get a raise. My family's suffering. What is it that you know that I don't know? You're not making any more money than me, but you have this glow about you. You have this assuredness about your life. And then you can share your story. You can share your story about, well, I have a teacher. My teacher's no longer alive, but it doesn't matter. He still, he still holds this, this lesson for me to follow. And he comes to me with world events. And I know it's him, even though I don't see his face. People will ask who it is, and that's how they can learn to transform their lives. And I'll give you one quick example. I know you're running out of time. No, it's okay. We can go on. Yesterday, Prashanti Nilliam, a 42-year-old man, walked up to my wife and said, Jody. He recognized her from our uh, Radio Sci type interviews that we put on Soul Journeys on YouTube and Vimeo. He says, I recognize you from Soul Journeys. I'd like to see Ted and say hello to him. Well, you'll recognize him. He's unmistakable. He's seven foot tall and he walks around here. You'll see he's big. You'll, you'll recognize <laughs> who he is. He came up to me after Darshan. And uh, this is the night before last. And I said, well, we're going to go tour this uh, home for old people that Swami's devotees has started. You're welcome to come with us tomorrow. So he came with us yesterday. And I said, how long have you been following Swami? Well, I'm 42. I'm, I'm a professional tennis player. I've traveled the world. I've made millions of dollars. I've had wonderful events and relationships. Everything has fallen apart. Everything has depressed me. Everything has taken me downhill. I've only known Swami for six months. How did you come across Swami? Well, somebody gave me a link to some of the videos, and I've seen some of these compelling stories, and I couldn't believe them. Is that all that happened? Oh, no, no, no. Six months ago, I was so depressed. At 3 o'clock in the morning, I got out of my bed. I didn't know what might happen. I was so depressed. So I called the emergency rescue hotline, I think in Australia, and they'll talk to you and they'll work you through your depression. And if you have tendencies for suicide, they will hold your hand and get you help. I called this emergency hotline and they were so busy, they put me on hold for 15 minutes. And I said, you could have committed suicide in 15 minutes if you were that depressed. What saved you? He said, I don't know what inspired me to do this, but I put the phone down and I got down under my knees and I said to the universe, if you're there, God, I've tried everything. You must help me. Sai Baba came to him. Sai Baba came to him. How? I always ask that question. It doesn't matter how. His name came to him. His face came to him. 
Uh, he knew this much about Sai Baba and didn't believe, wasn't open to it. And one thing led after another, and he got a hold of Sam Sanweiss's book. He saw more videos, stories of people's lives being transformed just like that. And he had been on a spiritual path. It had been 100% head-oriented. And he had a total, total, total transformation of the heart, complete. You see him now, he's in bliss. He's not delusional, he's not insane. He's as normal as you and me, except he's found bliss, he's found Baba's love. And this is after Baba's physical form left us. He's never seen Sai Baba. He was never a devotee while Sai Baba was alive. And the takeaway message for me is, we don't know the importance of our duty. You don't have to be a volunteer working for Radio Sai. You don't have to have your own video interviews called Soldiers. Just live your life. Be, be the Baba presence that he has instilled in your heart and people will come to you and they will find out what's changed your life. And in that inquiry, other lives are changed. And so I have no doubt about it whatsoever that Baba is changing the world. It has nothing to do with his Maha Samadhi. It, does, it doesn't matter one whit that his body is no longer here and that his presence can no longer be savored and that people have never been followers while he was alive physically. So that's, that's my message that we all have an unknown duty now that's bigger than all the other duties. Number one is to awaken to our true selves. Number two, is to allow the awakening in us that's gradual be seen by other people without apology. You don't have to go say, come to Baba. Baba will fix your needs. He'll save your soul. You don't even have to ever mention his name and it'll happen. And that's what's happening. We are at the end of the Kali Yuga. The Satya Yuga begins in three days, four days, five days. <laughs> and it's, it's an enormous cycle. But this is when the timing is not just coincidental, it's perfect for all of us who love Baba to share his divine essence in your form and in your form and in your form. I'm reminded of uh, a letter that Swami Vivekananda had written to his brother disciples in 1896 when he was in the West. In the letter, he very clearly mentions so many of my brother disciples, they have got this tendency to put the stuff down everyone's throat that Sri Ramakrishna Paramahansa <laughs> is a god. He says, just keep this thing apart. You are converting our movement into a sect. Yeah. And he said, please distance yourself from such viewpoints. And if people want to worship him as god, we need not encourage or discourage them. However, the masses probably will want the, pers the person, but the higher ones will want the principle. Yeah. And he goes on, to, go, goes on to say, both are needed, but principles are universal. Stick to the principles and let people think whatever they like of the person. And that, he was the first to bring the message of Advaita to the West. And he was the first to rekindle interest in the message that was alive and kicking and very healthy at the beginning of Christianity, at the beginning of Judaism. But in their wisdom, the leaders of these religions allow that concept to fall away, to not be practiced, to be forgotten. He brought it back as if it were brand new. And, and we can all live that lesson today. I had an example of that same concept that Vivekananda talked about. Mm, 11, 12, 13 years, 14 years ago. I brought home some wonderful interviews on Soul Journeys and showed them to my Sai Baba study circle class. There are 30 of us, 40 of us there. We met in Cleveland, Ohio, and if they knew I was bringing a video to show them somebody's story, uh, there'd be 50 people there. And a, a woman by the name of Susan came up to me one night, and she was very bright and very serious as a, as a spiritual aspirant, and she said, Ted, I've noticed you've been bringing some stories about materializations and miracles, and those are all good, and it's like candy. They're fun. But I would rather not see those. And I said, well, what was it that you'd rather see? She said, I would rather see, by a margin of 100 to 1, 
Stories of Personal Transformation, How Sai Baba and the Lives of the Devotees Transformed Their Lives. And I learned that lesson myself that day. I'll still sneak in some materialization stories and some wonderful miracles. Who doesn't like those? Those are Baba's candy for us. Visiting cards. Visiting cards. Tinsel, trinkets, and trash so that you'll come to know and appreciate what I really have to give you. The moksha, the liberation, knowing who you are. There's the Ted you think I am. There's the Ted I think I am. And then there's the real Ted. And nobody in this room has a clue as to who the real Bishu is, the real Ted is. So these are the stories that are really worth explaining if we can get our hands on them. And as Vivekananda put it so eloquently, this woman put it to me the same way. Share the stories of personal transformation. And that's what you do so well on Radio Psy. I don't know how many thousands of interviews you have now. And I'm so glad you're doing video interviews because it conveys a person's truth, not just verbally, but through their heart and through their eyes. You can see that in individuals, and that's why I'm so happy doing it with my work. Because these, I sit there like this, and I'll hear a person's story, and it doesn't matter if I'm going to share it with anybody else in the face of the earth. They have a deep impact on me, and that's what we can do now, just like Vivekananda said. I think that boomerang Leela that is happening in your life is happening with each one of us in the studio too. Yeah. I think every one of us are doing what we are doing because we are doing it actually for our own yeah. spiritual growth. Passion is infectious. And when we realize that we go through barrier uh, levels of passion, just like we go through levels of class, yes, you're going to be a scientist. You're in the first level, second level, third level, 20 levels down the road. You're still learning more about science. It's even more important with Baba at the helm and our spiritual growth. Because I'm starting to encounter now, and maybe you are too. Tell me if you are. I'm starting to encounter real people. You have your truth detectors inside of you and you try to tell if a person's legitimate and genuine, I'm starting to detect more and more realized people. I really am. Not that I am. <laughs> I'll, could, I'll probably be the last on this earth. <laughs> I hope not, but I could, I could very well be. It's okay. I, I bask in the light of people who I sense are already realized. Yeah. And I know them because of three characteristics. Their compassion, their humility, and their almost or total absence of ego. So when you come across a person and they're not advertising themselves, they're not volunteering to be interviewed, they don't care if you listen to them or not, they're at equanimity. But when you come across a person who has deep compassion, tons of humility, and almost no or none of the ego, they become magnets and draw you to them. And just basking in their aura grows you. And Baba is the supreme teacher of that, whether he walks the Darshan Hall or not. Fantastic. And I think that is really so much good news because often the news in the media can be very distressing. And these news don't many times reach people. Yeah. And I think this is the good news that has to be shared. I know, I know something about news. Yes. I know very little. <laughs> I worked in my dad's hardware store. I don't know if a hardware store is a concept in India or not growing up. So I know about hardware and I know about news. That's all I know about. <laughs> Maybe a little bit about so... Baba. And, and I know that after 10,000 interviews and 44 years total of reporting on rapes, homicides, car accidents, <laughs> corrupt politicians, and, and people committing suicide, and, and there are all these awful, awful, awful things, and wars and pestilence. I know that all of those 44 years were the kindergarten, were the primary school of my journalistic experience so that I would one day be at a level to share stories about Sai Baba with others. And I've said this to my wife a dozen times. It's almost been four years since I retired. The most satisfying journalism I've ever done is now. It Fantastic. just it, it fills me, and I'm happy to share it, not because it's an ego thing necessarily. There might be a little ego left in all of us, but it's because my eyes bug out just like yours do when somebody says something that's unbelievable. I won't go into details, but I heard a story just five minutes before starting this interview from uh, one of your coworkers there, yes. and my I, I went like that. Really? You saw this? It happened? <laughs> yes. Uh, and... This is all there for all of us. It's all there for all of us. And I think that is a message for all of us who many times get distressed by reading all the news items. There's actually a lot of good happening. And, and I want to ask you, now that you have uh, 
interviewed so many people and also met so many people who are realized souls. How do you see the current trend of the world? <laughs> How do I see the current trend of the world? Uh, quote Jack Hawley. Jack Hawley was a great Sai Baba devotee who just turned 80. He came through our neck of the woods in Florida this summer in his RV. He and his wife, uh, Louise, have spent the last 35 years, six months in Prashanti Nilayam, six months in Palm Springs, California. This is their fourth generation of RV. Can you imagine two 80-year-olds driving through the mountains of America from coast to coast in an RV by themselves? They do it. All they need is Baba. Baba's with them the whole way. They're perfectly safe. And the quote I'm thinking of is when I sat down in this little flat here at Prashanti Nilayam to interview him, I asked him about fear. I said, what causes you fear? Nothing. He's the one who told me that when he gets up in the morning at 4 o'clock, before he eats the first mouthful of breakfast, he says, Om Sai Ram 10,000 times. He wasn't boasting. I said, well, what do you do to fill your day? He says, well, Baba fills my day. I asked him, how does Baba fill your day? <clears throat> well, when I get up before breakfast, I say Sai Ram 10,000 times. <laughs> it's phenomenal. I, I laugh because I'm amazed that people are capable of doing this. So I asked him about fear. There's much to fear. That's the question you're asking me. The world's going to Hell in a handbasket, as the phrase goes in America, <laughs> or so it seems. It's not going anywhere. But the fear that's caused as a result of all this strife doesn't exist for Jack Hawley. What do you mean it doesn't exist? What about if you got sick? Oh, pff. passing clouds, passing clouds. What if Louise, your wife, got sick? Oh, pff. we both know that that's she's okay, as Baba says. Uh, it's only your body that's sick. Well, what about your daughter? What about a tragedy that might claim her life? That doesn't cause me fear. I know what's real. I know that that wouldn't be real. Well, what about nuclear holocaust? Well, that, that doesn't cause me any fear at all. Well, what about death, a painful death for you? Oh, no, that's, that's all part of the illusion. That doesn't, that doesn't cause me any fear at all. I won't be going anywhere. My body, my body is just my body. What he taught me was that you can get to the point in this world following Baba's teachings where fear ends. It just ends. If you actually believe Baba's number one message, which is the hardest message for any of us earthly beings to believe that none of this is real, that this is an illusion, and that my heart is an illusion, and that Baba's form is an illusion, because he said so, don't become addicted to my form, well, that's the key. How could there be fear? How could there be worry about the next third world war or pestilence or the next typhoon. Now, this is for a mature aspirant. I would never suggest, and please forgive me if anybody's in pain right now, I would never consciously say this to anybody in pain of any kind because it wouldn't be fair because I don't want to be tested. You know, if, if somebody does some harm to my son or my daughter or my wife, I don't know where I would be. I would be destroyed. I don't have as much faith as Jack Hawley, maybe. So I would never say this consciously or knowingly in somebody's presence who's in pain. But I'm assuming that those of us who are on the spiritual path of Sai Baba see the merit in this interpretation in these words. We have to follow his greatest teaching, if not in spirit, if not in practicality, at least beginning in the mind. And there's a great phrase that we use in America that I've used to build my spiritual life. Fake it until you make it. Have you ever heard that <laughs> phrase? Yeah. They say you first, you begin to pretend, start pretending, then you will tend to do it and then you'll end up doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Fake it till you make it. I mean, it's, it's trite. It's a cliche, but it's true. We all get there. Not one of us will miss the train. Not one of us will be left behind. I don't care if it takes you... One more lifetime or me, a hundred more lifetimes. It doesn't matter. So if you really believe that, then you will start to see that all of this is maya. And in the illusion of life, we start to use that to our advantage. So here's Ted. I'm looking at Baba's picture. It's a photograph taken when he was maybe 50 or so. And I love Baba's form and I love Prashanti Nilayam. 
But the, the real me is starting to suggest very loudly, whether it's really the real me or I'm faking believing it's the real me, that this is part of Advaita. Every construct you think of is part of, even ideas are material. You have to start using the, the illusion to elevate yourself through it until you get on top of it and grow beyond it. That's how I look at it. It's still impossible for most people to understand, even me. That's how I envision it. That it's here for a purpose. In the mind of God, there was an errant thought that I think I am real. And that I'm going to be happy if I amass millions of dollars. Well, it's not true. <laughs> or I'm going to be poor if my house burns down and I lose my wife. Well, it's not true. It's just not true. You are God, you know, and I know lots of people who talk that way, and I'm not one. I'm surprised to hear myself say that right now. In, in The Course in Miracles, in the Unity Church, they'll go so far as to say, you are a shard of the divine. You are the light of God. You are a perfect child of God. All of those are wrong. You are Baba. And that is what Swami said right from the time he announced his avatarhood. Even my saying, you are Baba, is wrong because that implies separation from God. That implies that you are Baba and maybe I'm not. The, the only way to say this is I am. So if, if you say I am, I, I'll know that you're my teacher because I need to hear that lesson expressed that way over and over again. So I don't know if this answers your question very well, but it's a very important concept Yes, I to think deal that, with the that, world that today. is the uh, that is the pinnacle uh, yeah. of uh, every spiritual aspirant. Yeah, we have our duty. Yes. If, if if India falls into crisis, you yes. have your duty to help yes. Mother India, yes. and you will. Yes. You can say there's one part of me that sees it totally as illusion. Why bother? But there's another part that says Ted and others remind me to work within the illusion. So do your duty. Do your role. Do your work. Yeah. Yes. And and let let that bring you to the point of equanimity. My view of life can be simply reduced to equanimity, and that is here's fear, here's joy, here's pain, here's pleasure, here's prosperity, here's good health, here's death. Here, you can't see it, but way up at the ceiling, if I could reach that high, is equanimity. And it is the position where whatever you're looking at, World War III and the next nuclear holocaust, or the birth of a child that's pure love, they register the same. They register the same. Your heart doesn't go up, it doesn't go down, your heart beat. It's not because you're indifferent. It's because there is no separation from God and all of that is illusory. That is what is mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita. The mark of a true devotee is being always in the same level, equanimity. That's it. That's my goal. I wonder how quickly I'll get talking there. talking to Gene Massey. He said, for me, the golden age has already arrived. I'm in the golden age. Sure. It's, it's, it's a change of perspective. I, I think I, this is a slight exaggeration, but I think I know a thousand people for whom the golden age has already started. Let's say a hundred people. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you have to make that uh, change in your uh, yeah. vision, yeah. as Tommy says. You might still get down. You might still get depressed. You might still get angry. But those are passing clouds too, just like a cold, just like the flu. Those are all passing clouds. You spring back from them. <clears throat> the people who get to the level that no longer have a doubt or any fluctuation in their love, there's a term for that. Are you familiar? You of all people should be. Uh, in the West, we've never heard of the term before. Jivan Mukta. Yes. Jivan Mukta is not just a realized soul, but it's a realized soul at 24-7. Yes. Many, most realized people, th those who are thought of a they get into bliss and self-realization and they fall out of it. And something old, a, 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 a bad occurrence will bring them out of it. I know of Ajiva Mukta. I've interviewed her. She's now deceased. She was one of what Baba said was, I think, a, a hundred or fewer Ajiva Muktas at the moment. They're not that common. But you can see if you have the, if you have the great privilege to be in their presence, that they're just what you described, Bishu. They're at a level of equanimity, and you can say anything, and it won't bother you. Well, Baba's the example of that. Baba's way above a Jeevan Mukta, 
uh, but in the human form of those who might be walking the earth today, you couldn't hurt them if your life depended on it. You couldn't disappoint them. You couldn't cause them anger. You couldn't make them dis uh, feel awful for your ignorance. They would just see you as an infant and smile and love you all the more. That's what we have to look forward to. And I think the one of the very simplest ways that Swami has given us how we can implement this in our lives is whatever happens to me is for my own good. Well, after years and years and years of trying to understand the problems I make for myself and the pain I bring myself, I now have a one-word response to all of it. Whenever it happens, sometimes it takes me three days to say this one word. Sometimes it takes me three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Baba. No matter, uh, knock on wood, I'm not inviting more travail and tragedy <laughs> into my life right now. But whenever it occurs, the faster I get to, thank you, Baba. I'm not, I'm not a masochist. I'm not grateful for hurt. I now see it totally differently. It's a call to awaken to our higher self. So why would you not be thankful for that? It's a whole different way of looking at the good and the bad in our lives. The Fantastic. perceived good and bad. There is no bad. You, you're talking about good and bad and perceived good and bad. I just read how Baba has described this four different levels, the different stages, uh, different kinds of personalities that we see in this world. Swami said, the person who sees only good, only right everywhere, he's divine. The person who sees right as right and bad as bad is human. <laughs> the person who shuts his eyes to the right and sees only the bad is something like of an animal nature. Uh -huh. And the person who sees the right and calls that and manipulates that as bad is a demon. Well, gee, those are, those. I didn't read that. I haven't heard that before. Thank you for sharing that. It's very helpful. The first one again was the person who the sees, person everything, who as sees good. everything as good and right is yeah. divine. Well, that's where I'm faking it until I make it. Because I'm not there yet, but I'm really faking it. Yes. I want that to be true. I really love these beautiful things that Swami says. So simply he makes us, uh, totally makes, makes spirituality for yeah. us. And your choice is to accept it or condemn it. It's your choice. In the end, you'll find out how true that is. And you will also make it with all the other people. But it, The Course in Miracles says the choice you have, Baba is keen on saying we have as much free will as a, donkey tethered to a hitching post. Yes. The Course in Miracles, which he wrote, says, everybody gets there to the same destination. The choice is yours, whether you want to do it quickly or take the scenic route. Pretend you're a millionaire for a while and enjoy the five-star hotels and looking down on people below your class. You'll still get there. It'll just take a little longer. Probably the road has a little more of ups and downs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So you mentioned that everything that happens in our life, ultimately we, we have to learn to say thank you, God. And today, now I want to thank Swami for <laughs> enabling you to come to the studio no, and no, no. share these uh, reflections and experiences with us. Fantastic. Thank you so much for taking your time out. And I want to go back to your conversation, the talk that you gave in 2008. You were in Prashantinam that time and gave that powerful speech in the presence of Swami and you are now again in Prashantinilam, this is 2012 and you are in the studios of Radio Sai. What would you like to say to all the devotees and everyone as we prepare for another Christmas? Boy, that's a big one. Um, a lot of people put a great value on forgiveness for others. Forgive everybody for their hurts that they've caused you. I no longer feel that way. I feel all of it is part of the divine plan. Again, I come to you know, love is important. Forgiveness is important in the right scale. <clears throat> Gratitude is of maximum importance. Know who you really are and just be grateful for that. Know the season's joy and happiness it brings is not illusory. It doesn't last for just a minute. It does for many people in the material world. But you can keep the Christmas joy in your heart forever with Baba's teachings, with Christ's teachings. They're one and the same. So, as my good friend, Father Charles Ogata, used to say here many, many times over the years, be happy. And he would mimic Baba, and he would say, be happy. Be, be, be aware that you're living in the moment of time that's greater than any moment before. Not just in the history of the world, not just in the history 
of the universe, but in the history of all there is, this is the moment to be most grateful. You're with Baba. You're one with the divine. You are the divine. Be happy. That's what I would say. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Sairam. Sairam.